Good morning again. It's good to see everybody. After crazy, crazy weeks like this where it's a holiday, it's kind of kind of nice just to be able to <clears throat> come back and relax a little bit in it and uh, just be able to see our church family together. Um, I do hope that each one of you had a, a good Thanksgiving, enjoyed your time uh, being with family. David and Rachel are out in Oklahoma um, seeing his family, so um, he will be back this week, and then we'll be back to our normal routine following. So uh, just bear with us this week, and then you'll get to see David again. So um, it'll be okay. Imagine being at the mall, and as you're in the mall, across the food court, you see your favorite celebrity or athlete or just that famous person that you've always wanted to meet. And you see them, and there's really not a big crowd, so you hurry up and you grab your phone, and you run over where they're standing, and you turn your back to them, and you snap a quick selfie, right? Okay, a selfie is a picture that you take of yourself. Um, and so, just so we're clear. Um, and, and now you have this picture that says that you met this celebrity, right? So you're going to go and you're going to post it all out on social media that today was the greatest day ever because I got to meet whomever that person is. And now you're famous, right? Because you have that picture. Not really. You're not famous. That person has no clue who you are. That person could care less whether or not you were at the same mall that they were. They could care less to have a relationship with you at that moment. This morning, I want us to go on a trip, and I want us to see what it really looks like to have an encounter with somebody that longs to have a relationship with us. This morning, these two chairs represent man and God. So don't look at these as chairs anymore. Look at them as man and God. We read in Genesis that that God created everything in six days. That's pretty impressive. And after God made everything, he said it was good, except for one thing us. When God created mankind, he said it was very good. (laughs) I wish I could beg to differ with some people that he created, but you know, we're we're not going to judge this morning. God designed each one of us in his image. He made us to be like him. That is a close intimate relationship to where God molds us to be like him. This is a relationship that where God shows up in a garden, where God says, you know what? I'm not only going to create these people, I'm going to live with these people. I'm going to walk side by side with these people. They knew each other. God wanted to be so close to them that he was side by side with Adam and Eve in the garden. But we know what happened. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. 
Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So here we have it. At the beginning, God was there with Adam and Eve. God had this close relationship with Adam and Eve. And then Adam and Eve decided to go against God. And so from that moment, there was distance that was created between man and God. There's this huge void that because of their choice, it's now there. From that moment, sin has impacted the world. We see how man's relationship with God has almost become like that selfie that we took with the celebrity that says, hey, look, I know God. I have somewhat of a relationship with God, but it's kind of a distant relationship. It's a relationship to where I can still live the way I want to live, but I can still say that I know God because of this distance that was created. So God realizes that there's distance. And he wants to try to do whatever he can to bring this relationship back together. So God realizes that now his people are in slavery. Pharaoh's got the Israelite nation in slavery. So in God-like fashion, he comes again in a bush. Listen to what Exodus says. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horab, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'm going to go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush doesn't burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt." God came in a special way. God showed up in a way that Moses knew was out of the ordinary. A way that got Moses' attention to know that God was near. And we know that Moses had this, this conversation with God where he was like, God, I'm not the right person. God, don't choose me. There's somebody better. But God chose him anyway. God came with a purpose, a desire to use Moses in big ways. So now God's starting to figure out a way to bring his people back a little bit closer to him. To where now this relationship is starting to get a little bit more intimate again to where people are starting to realize that this God is really a God that wants to have a relationship with us, a God that wants to deliver us out of this horrible slavery and bring us to the promised land. But even with this deliverance from slavery and with their entrance into the promised land, God still wasn't satisfied with this relationship. 
he knew that there was more that could be done to bring this relationship closer. He wants more than a selfie with us. God desires this relationship. He wanted to be super close to us. So again, in a crazy cool kind of God way, he shows up as a baby. He sends an angel to this teenage girl and her fiancé to let them know that they're going to be with child. Imagine how that looked to the people in the town. This girl and this guy that are engaged to be married, and all of a sudden the girl shows up pregnant. Imagine telling their parents what happened. Imagine the story. Joseph goes to Mary's dad and's like, um, she's pregnant. But it's not my fault. Right? I mean, Joseph's dad or Mary's dad's gonna be like, right, buddy, let's go out back. Right? And that's just kind of the way that works from this human's perspective. But God had a plan with all of this. Listen to what Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 say. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So again, God comes again in a very profound kind of way. And because of this baby, that relationship is starting to get even closer. But yet there's still some distance. There's still some things that, that God knows aren't right, that are creating this gap in between. So like all babies, this baby grows and he develops into a man. A man that would change the world. Remember back to Adam and Eve, how their actions changed the world for the negative. So God says, hold on, I'm going to send somebody else that's going to change the world, but for the positive. God came as a savior. Listen to what Matthew 27, 45 through 54 say. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. So this baby came. And he taught all of these lessons through his life. And then he was crucified. Because there was a gap. There was this divide between God and man that God had no other way of showing how much he loved his people rather than sending his son to die. Because of man's mistakes. And so now this relationship is back to where it started. This relationship 
is close. This relationship looks like it should. Or does it? Because God knew he could even get closer than this. He wanted to live in us. After Jesus rose from the dead, he was walking with two men on the road to Emmaus. Listen to this encounter that he had with them in Luke chapter 24, and verses 45 through 49. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So at this moment, God says, you know what? I'm not just going to walk beside you. I'm not going to have just this side-by-side kind of relationship. Rather, I'm going to have a relationship where I am living in you. And we are one. That is a close relationship. That's a relationship that can't get any closer. Because God chose to live in us. The creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the father of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, this is the God that wants to live in us. The people that started this whole distance of a relationship. He still desires to have that relationship with us. That says, you know what? I'm going to live in you. Let's go back and revisit Moses' encounter with God. I believe that through this, this one encounter especially, we can learn a lot about how we're supposed to come before the one that longs to dwell in us. The thing Moses did first was he listened. He heard God's voice. Moses knew the voice of his creator. But he not only heard it, but he responded. When God called out to Moses, Moses said, God, here I am. Whereas with Adam and Eve, they played hide and seek. Big difference. Moses responded to the voice of God. And finally, Moses knew where he was standing. Moses knew that the place that God was, was holy ground. And so God said, buddy, you need to take off your shoes because I'm here. And this is holy ground. Because we know anywhere where God is, that's holy ground. So Moses took off his shoes and he stood barefoot before God. This morning, I'm going to encourage us to do something. Something that that may be a little bit odd. Something that may be a little bit uncomfortable. But I have a feeling that Moses probably thought that encounter with God was a little bit odd and a little bit uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you to remove your shoes. I'm going to ask that we all just go ahead and take off our shoes. I know this is really weird, isn't it? Like, oh no, what are we doing, right? And then once your shoes are off, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I know some of us are probably thinking, oh man, if I knew he was going to do this, I'd have worn better socks, <laughs> right? My big toe's poking out now, and, and now people can see it. Well, guess what? That's okay. Because the coolest thing is, is that God doesn't care about our socks. But what this represents is that that we're standing before God. At this moment, our bare feet, I want to represent our lives. Our heart is bare open to God. 
Because right now, where we are is holy ground. See, it was at this moment that Moses knew God wanted a relationship with him. Moses knew that God wanted to be close to him. And so Moses followed God's call. He didn't argue. God said, or Moses said, God, here I am. Do with me what you want. And this morning as we stand here barefooted and barehearted, God's calling us. God's saying, I want to be close to you. This morning, God is choosing to come near to us. Go ahead and have a seat, and you can go ahead and put your shoes on. But right now, at this very moment, God longs to live in each one of us. God doesn't give us this this physical experience of a burning bush. But God gives us these stories of a burning bush to show how he comes into our lives, how he desires to have this relationship. He gives us his spirit. He gives us this this chance to have this relationship like no other relationship. A relationship where we are one. Not walking side by side, not just kind of going for a stroll, but this intimate relationship that says, you know what, I love you. So this morning, I want to ask, just like J. Red and James, are we whispering that yes to God to where he comes near to us? Because that's what he's waiting on. God's done everything to bridge this relationship. The only thing that he's waiting on is us to say yes. It doesn't matter if we already have this relationship with God through baptism or if we haven't made that decision yet we still have to be willing to invest in that relationship. So this morning, as we stand and as we we sing this song of invitation, I want us to ask ourselves, am I really able to say, God, here's my heart and my mind, my body, my soul. Take control of it all. Because that's what he's waiting on. That's what God came for. God came to be near to us. This morning, if you have a need, if there's things that you need prayers for from the church, if there's things that you're struggling with, let us know. Open up your heart to God and allow this church family to pray for you. If you haven't, Oh, God, God, I want this relationship with you. And if that's something that you want to do, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. To tell you what that means, the significance of that relationship. Because God's done everything already.
All we have to do is come to him as we stand and sing.